Hello, listening squirrels. I'm sorry. I apologize for not reading yesterday. It's just one of those days I just didn't get it done. I gotta start doing better. Anyway, let's go ahead on chapter 17, Plain Grandmother. I think Tom had the hardest time of all, for besides the family troubles, he had many of his own to perplex and harass him. College scrapes were soon forgotten in greater afflictions, but there were plenty of tongues to blame for that extravagant dog, and plenty of heads to wag ominously over prophecies of the good time Tom Shaw would now make on the road to ruin. As reporters flourish in this country, of course, Tom soon heard all the friendly criticisms passed upon him and his career, and he suffered more than anybody guessed. For the truth was at the bottom of the gossip. For the truth that was at the bottom of the gossip filled him with a sharp, a sharp regret and impotent wrath against himself as well as others, which drives many a proud fellow so placed to destruction or the effort that redeems boyish folly and makes a man of him. Now that he had lost his heritage, Tom seemed to see for the first time how goodly it had been, how rich in power, pleasure, and gracious opportunities. He felt its worth even while he acknowledged with a sense of justice that it's wrong in manly men how little he deserved a gift which he had so misused. He brooded over this a good deal, for like the bat in the fable, he didn't seem to find any place in the new life which had begun for all. Knowing nothing of business, he was not of much use to his father, though he tried to be, and generally ended up by feeling he was a hindrance, not a help. Domestic affairs were equally out of his line, and the girls, more frank than their father, did not hesitate to tell him he was in the way when he offered to lend a hand anywhere. After the first excitement was over and he had time to think, heart and energy seemed to die out. Remorse got hold of him, and as generous... Thoughtless natures are apt to do when suddenly confronted with conscience. He exaggerated his faults and follies into sins of the deepest dye, and fancied he was regarded by others as a villain and an outcast. Pride and penitence made him shrink out of sight as much as possible, for he could not bear pity, even when silently expressed by a friendly eye, friendly hand, or kindly eye. He stayed at home a good deal and loafed about with a melancholy and neglected air, vanished when anyone came, talked very little, and was either pathetically humble or tragically cross. He wanted to do something, but nothing seemed to appear, and while he waited to get his poise after the downfall, he was so very miserable that I'm afraid, if it had not been for one thing, my poor Tom would have got desperate and been a failure. But when he seemed most useless, outcast and forlorn, he discovered that one person needed him. One person never found him in the way one person always welcomed and clung to him with the strongest affection of a very feeble nature. This dependence of his mother's was Tom's salvation at that crisis of his life. And the gossips who said softly to one another over their muffins and tea, it really would be a relief to that whole family if poor dear Mrs. Shaw could be <clears throat> mercifully removed. Did not know that the invalid's weak, idle hands were unconsciously keeping the son safe in that quiet room where she gave him all that she had to give mother love till he took heart again and faced the world ready to fight his battles manfully. Dear, dear, how old and bent poor father does look. I hope he won't forget to order my sweet bread, sighed Mrs. Shaw one day, as she watched her husband slowly going down the street. 
Tom, who stood by her, idly spinning the curtain tassel, followed the familiar figure with his eye, and seen how gray the hair had grown, how careworn the florid face, and how like a weary old man his once strong, handsome father walked. He was smitten by a new pang of self-reproach, and with his usual impetuosity set about repairing the omission as soon as he discovered it. I'll see to your sweetbread, Mum. Goodbye, back to dinner. And with a hasty kiss, Tom was off. He didn't know exactly what he meant to do, but it had suddenly come over him that he was hiding from the storm and letting his father meet it alone, for the old man went to his office every day with the regularity of a machine that would go to its usual round until it stopped. While the young man stayed at home with the women and let his mother comfort him, he has a right to be ashamed of me, but I act as if I was ashamed of him. Dare say people think so. I'll show them I ain't. Yes, by the powers I will. And Tom drew on his gloves with the air of a man about to meet and conquer an enemy. Have an arm, sir? If you don't mind, I'll walk down with you. Little commission for mother. Nice day, isn't it? Tom rather broke down at the end of his speech for the look of pleased surprise with which his father greeted him. The alacrity with which he accepted and leaned on the strong arm offered him proved that the daily walks had been solitary and doubtless sad ones. I think Mr. Shaw understood the real meaning of that little act of respect and felt better for the hopeful change it seemed to foretell. But he took it quietly, and leaving his face to speak for him, merely said, Thank you, Tom. Yes, Mother will enjoy her dinner twice as much if you order it. Then they began to talk business with all their might, as if they feared that some trace of sentiment might disgrace their masculine dignity. But it made no difference whether they discussed lawsuits or love, mortgages or mothers. The feeling was all right, and they knew it. So Mr. Shaw walked straighter than usual, and Tom felt that he was in his proper place again. The walk was not without its trials, however, for while it did Tom's heart good to see the cordial respect paid to his father, it tried his patience solely to see an inquisitive or to see also inquisitive or disapproving glances fixed upon himself when hats were lifted to his father and to hear the hearty good day, Mr. Shaw, drop into a cooler, careless, that's the son, it's hard on him, wild fella, do him good. Granted, but you needn't hit a man when he's down, muttered Tom to himself, feeling every moment a stronger desire to do something that should silence everybody. I'd cut away to Australia if it wasn't for Mother. Anything, anywhere to get out of the way of people who know me. I never can write myself here with all the fellows watching and laying wagers whether I sink or swim. Hang Greek and Latin. Wish I'd learned to trade and had something to fall back upon. Having a blessed thing now but decent French in my fist. Wonder if old Bell don't want a clerk for the Paris branch of the business. That wouldn't be bad. Faith, I'll try it. And when Tom had landed his father safely at the office to the great edification of all beholders, he screwed up his courage and went to prefer his request, feeling that the prospect brightened a little. But Mr. Bell was not in a good humor and only gave Tom a severe lecture on the errors of his ways, which sent him home much depressed and caused the horizon to lower again. As he roamed about the house that afternoon trying to calculate how much an Australian outfit would cost, the sound of lively voices and clattering spoons attracted him to the kitchen. There he found Polly giving mild lessons in cookery for the new help not being a high-priced article could not be depended on for desserts, and Mrs. Shaw would have felt as if the wolf was at the door if there was not a sweet dish at dinner. 
Maud had a genius for cooking, and Fanny hated it, so that little person was in her glory studying rec receipt. Not recipe, receipt books, which Mama always called recipes, receipts. And taking lessons whenever Polly could give them. Gracious me, Tom, don't come now. We're awful busy. Men don't belong in kitchens, cried Maud as her brother appeared in the doorway. Couldn't think what you were all about. Mama's asleep and fan out, so I loafed down to see if there was any fun afoot, said Tom, lingering. As if the prospect was agreeable, he was a social fellow and very grateful just then to anyone who helped him to forget his worries for a time. Polly knew this, felt that his society would not be a great affliction to herself at least, and whispering to Maud, he won't know, she added aloud, come in if you like and stir this cake for me, it needs a strong hand and mine are tired. There, put on that apron to keep you tidy. Sit here and take it easy. I used to help Grandma bat up cake and rather liked it, if I remember right, said Tom, letting Polly tie a checked apron on him. Put a big bowl into his hands and settle him near the table where Maud was picking raisins. And she herself stirring busily about stirring busily about among spice boxes, rolling pins, and butter pots. You do it beautifully, Tom. I'll give you a conundrum to lighten your labor. Why are bad boys like cake? asked Polly, anxious to cheer him up. Because a good beating makes them better. I doubt that myself, though, answered Tom, nearly knocking the bottom of the bowl out with his energetic demonstrations for it really was a relief to do something. Bright boy, here's a plum for you, and Polly threw a plum raisin into his mouth. Put in lots, won't you? I'm rather fond of plum, plum cake, observed Tom, likening himself to Hercules with the distaff, and finding his employment pleasant, if not classical. I always do if I can. There's nothing I like better than to shovel in sugar and spice and make nice plummy cake for people. It's one of the few things I have a gift for. You've hit it this time, Polly. You certainly have a gift for putting a good deal of both articles into your own and other people's lives, which is lucky as we are all as we all have to eat that sort of cake, whether we like it or not, observed Tom. So soberly that Polly opened her eyes and Maud exclaimed, I do believe he's preaching. Feel as if I could sometimes, continued Tom. Then his eye fell upon the dimples in Polly's elbows and he added with a laugh, There's more in your line, ma'am. Can't you give, that's more in your line, ma'am. Can't you give us a sermon? A short one. Life, my brethren, is like plum cake, began Polly, impressively folding her flowery hands. In some, the plums are all at the top, and we eat them gaily till we suddenly find they're all gone. In others, the plums sink to the bottom, and we look for them in vain as we go on and often come to them when it's too late to enjoy them. <clears throat> But in the well-made cake, the plums are wisely scattered all through, and every mouthful is a pleasure. We make our own cakes in a great measure. Therefore, let us look to it, my brethren, that they are mixed according to the best receipt, baked in a well-regulated oven, and gratefully eaten with a temperate appetite. Good, good, cried Tom, applauding with the wooden spoon. That's a model sermon, Polly. Short, sweet, sensible, not a bit sleepy. I'm one of your parish and will see that you get your celery. <laughs> Spelled like celery. Punctual, as old Deacon Morris used to say. Thank you, brother. My wants is few and ravens scarcer than they used to be, as old dear as dear old Parson Miller used to answer. Now, Maud, bring on the citron, and Polly began to put the cake together in what seemed a most careless and chaotic manner, 
while Tom and Maud watched with absorbing interest until it was safely in the oven. Now make your custards, dear. Tom may like to beat the eggs for you. It seems to have a good effect upon his constitution. First rate, hand them along, and Tom smoothed his apron with a cheerful air. By the way, Sid's got back. I met him yesterday, and he treated me like man and brother. He added, as if anxious to contribute to the pleasures of the hour. I'm so glad, cried Polly, clapping her, her hands regardless of the egg she held, which dropped and smashed on the floor at her feet. Careless thing. Pick it up, Maud, or I'll get some more. And Polly, no, not or. I'll get some more. And Polly whisked out of the room, glad of an excuse to run and tell Fan, who had just come in, lest hearing the news in public, she might be startled out of the well-bred composure with which young ladies are expected to receive tidings, even of the most vital importance. You know all about history, don't you? asked Maud suddenly. Not quite, modestly answered Tom. I just want to know if there really was a man named Sir Philip in the time of Queen Elizabeth. You mean Sir Philip Sidney? Yes, he lived then, and a fine old fellow he was too. There, I knew the girls didn't mean him, cried Maud with a chop that sent the Centron flying. What mischief are you up to now, you little magpie? I shan't tell you what they said because I don't remember much of it. But I heard Polly and Fan talking about someone, about some one dreadful mysterious, someone dreadful mysterious. And when I asked who it was, Fan said, Sir Philip. Ho, oh, she needn't think I believe it. I saw them laugh and blush and poke one another, and I knew it wasn't about any old Queen Elizabeth man, cried Maud, turning up her nose as far as that somewhat limited feature would go. Look here, you're letting your cats out of the bag. Never mind, I thought so. They don't tell us their secrets, but we're so sharp we can't help finding them out, can we? said Tom, looking so much interested that Maud couldn't resist airing her knowledge a little. Well, I dare say it isn't proper for you to know, but I'm old enough now to be told anything, and those girls better mind what they say, for I'm not a stupid chit like Blanche. I just wish you could have heard them go on. I'm sure there's something very nice about Mr. Sidney. They look so pleased. When they whispered and giggled on the bed and thought I was ripping bonnets and didn't hear a word. Which looked most pleased, asked Tom, investigating the kitchen boiler with deep interest. Well, appears to me Polly did. She talked most and looked funny and very happy all the time. Fan laughed a good deal, but I guess Polly is the loveress, replied Maud after a moment's reflection. Hold your tongue, she's coming. And Tom began to pump as if the house was on fire. Down came Polly with heightened color, bright eyes, and not a single egg. Tom took a quick look at her over his shoulder and paused as if the fire was suddenly extinguished. Something in his face made Polly feel a little guilty, so she felt to grating nutmeg with a vigor which made red cheeks the most natural thing in life. Maud, the traitor, sat demurely at work, looking very like what Tom had called her, a magpie with mischief in its head. Polly felt a change in the atmosphere, but merely thought Tom was tired, so she graciously dismissed him with a stick of cinnamon, as she had nothing else just then to lay upon the shrine. Fan's got the books and maps you wanted. Go and rest now. I'm much obliged. Here's your wages, Bridget. Good luck to your messes, answered Tom as he walked away meditatively crunching his cinnamon and looking as if he did not find it as spicy as usual. He got his books but did not read them for shutting himself up in the little room called Tom's Den. He just sat down and brooded. 
When he came down to breakfast the next morning, he was greeted with a general, Happy Birthday, Tom! And at his place lay gifts from every member of the family. Not as costly as formerly, perhaps, but infinitely dearer. As tokens of the love that had outlived the change and only grown the warmer for the test of misfortune. In his present state of mind, Tom felt as he did not deserve a blessed thing. So when everyone exerted themselves to make it a happy day for him, he understood what it means to be nearly killed with kindness. And sternly resolved to be an honor to his family or perish in the attempt, evening brought Polly to what she called a festive tea. And when they gathered round the table, another gift appeared, which though not of a sentimental nature, touched Tom more than all the rest. It was a most delectable cake with a nosegay atop, and round it on the snowy frosting there ran a pink inscription, just as it had been every year since Tom could remember, name, age, and date, like a nice white tombstone observed mild complacently at which funeral remark, Mrs. Shaw, who was down in honor of the day, dropped her napkin and demanded her salts. Who's doing is that? asked Tom, surveying the gift with satisfaction, for it recalled the happier days, which seemed very far away now. I didn't know what to give you, for you've got everything a man wants, and I was in despair till I remembered that dear Grandma always made you a little cake like that and that you once said it wouldn't be a happy birthday without it. So I tried to make it just like hers, and I do hope it will prove a good, sweet, plummy one. Thank you, was all Tom had to say, or was all Tom said. As he smiled at the giver, but Polly knew that her present had pleased him more than the most elegant trifle she could have made. It ought to be good, for you beat it up yourself, Tom, cried Maud. It was so funny to see you working away and never guessing who the cake was for. I perfectly trembled every time you opened your mouth for fear you'd ask some question about it. That was the reason Polly preached, and I kept talking when she was gone. Very stupid of me, but I forgot all about today. Suppose we cut it. I don't seem to care for anything else, said Tom, feeling no appetite, but bound to do justice to that cake if he fell a victim to his gratitude. I hope the plums will not be at the bottom, said Polly, as she rose to do the honors of the cake by universal appointment. I've had a good many at the top already, you know, answered Tom, watching the operation with as much interest as if he had faith in the omen. Cutting carefully, slice after slice fell apart, each firm and dark, spicy and rich, under the frosty rime above and lay an especially large piece in one of Grandma's quaint little china plates. Polly added the flowers and handed it to Tom with a look that said a great deal. For seeing that he remembered her sermon, she was glad to find that her allegory held good. In one sense, at least, Tom's face brightened as he took it, and after an inspection which amused the others very much, he looked up saying with an air of relief, Plums all through. I'm glad I had a hand in it, but Polly deserves the credit and must wear the posy. And turning to her, he put the rose into her hair with more gallantry than taste, for a thorn pricked her head, the leaves tickled her ear, and the flower was upside down. <laughs> Fanny laughed at his want of skill, but Polly wouldn't have altered it, and everybody fell to eating cake as if indigestion was one of the lost arts. They had a lively tea and were getting on famously afterward when two letters were brought for Tom, who glanced at one and retired rather perceptively to his den, leaving Maud consumed with curiosity, and the older girl slightly excited for Fan thought she recognized the handwriting on one and Polly on the other. 
one half an hour and then another elapsed and Tom did not return. Mr. Shaw went out. Mrs. Shaw retired to her room, escorted by Maud, and the two girls sat together wondering if anything dreadful had happened. All of a sudden, a voice called, Polly! And that young lady started out of her chair as if the sound had been a thunderclap. Do run! I'm perfectly feigning to know what the matter is, said Fan. You'd better go, began Polly, wishing to obey it, feeling a little shy. He don't want me, besides. I couldn't say a word for myself if that letter was from Sydney, cried Fanny, hustling her friend towards the door in a great flutter. Polly went without another word, but she wore a curiously anxious look and stopped on the threshold of the den as if a little afraid of its occupant. Tom was sitting in his favorite attitude astride of a chair with his arms folded and his chin on the top rail, rail, not an elegant posture, but the only one in which he said he could think well. Whew, a whistle. Do you want me, Tom? Yes, come in, please. And don't look scared. I only want to show you a present I've had and ask your advice about accepting it. Why, Tom, you look as if you'd been knocked down, exclaimed Polly, forgetting all about herself as she saw his face when he rose and turned to meet her. I have regularly floored, but I'm up again and steadier than ever. Just you read that and tell me what you think of it. Tom snatched a letter off the table, put it into her hands, and began to walk up and down the little room like a veritable bear in its cage. As Polly read that short note, the color went all out of her face and her eyes began to kindle. When she came to the end, she stood a minute as if too indignant to speak, then gave the paper a nervous sort of crumple and dropped it on the floor, saying all in one breath, I think she is a mercenary, heartless, ungrateful girl. That's what I think. I think she's dropped him. I hope so. Oh, the deuce. I didn't mean to show that one. It's the other. And Tom took up a second paper, looking half angry, half ashamed at his own mistake. I don't care, though. Everyone will know tomorrow, and perhaps you'll be good enough to keep the girls from bothering me with questions and, and gavel, he added, as if on second thoughts he was relieved to have the communication made to Polly first. Well, I don't wonder you looked upset. If the other letter is as bad, I'd better have a chair before I read it, said Polly feeling that she began to tremble with excitement. It's a million times better, but it knocked me worse than the other. Kindness always does. Tom stopped short there and stood a minute, turning the letter about in his hand as if it contained a sweet, which neutralized the bitter in that smaller note and touched him very much. Then he drew up an armchair and beckoning Polly to take it in a sober, steady tone that surprised her greatly. Whenever I was in a quandary, I used to go and consult Grandma, and she always had something sensible or comfortable to say to me. She's gone now, but somehow, Polly, you seem to take her place. Would you mind sitting in her chair and letting me tell you two or three things, as Will does? Mind it, Polly felt that Tom had paid her the highest and most beautiful compliment. He could have devised. She had often longed to do it for being brought up in the most affectionate and frank relations with her brother. She had early learned what it takes most women sometime to discover. That sex does not make nearly as much difference in hearts and souls as we fancy. Joy and sorrow, love and fear, life and death bring so many of the same needs to all that the wonder is we do not understand each other better but wait till times of tribula wait till times of tribulation 
teach us that human nature is very much the same in men and women. Thanks to this knowledge, Polly understood Tom in a way that surprised and won him. She knew that he wanted womanly sympathy and that she could give to him because she was not afraid to stretch her arm across the barrier which our artificial education puts between boys and girls and to say to him, in all good faith, if I can help you, let me. Ten minutes sooner, Polly could have done this almost as easily to Tom as to Will, but in that ten minutes, something had happened, which made this difficult. Reading that Trix had given Tom back his freedom changed many things to Polly and caused her to shrink from his confidence because she felt as if it would be harder now to keep herself out of sight. To keep self out of sight. For spite of maiden modesty, love and hope would wake and sing at the good news. Slowly she sat down and hesitatingly she said with her eyes on the ground a very, a very humble voice, I'll do my best, but I can't fill a grandma's place or give you any wise good advice. I wish I could. You'll do it better than anyone else. Talk troubles, mother. Father has enough to think of without any of my worries. Fan is a good soul, but she isn't practical, and we always get into a snarl if we try to work together. So who have I but my other sister, Polly? The pleasure that letter will give you may make up for my boring you. As he spoke, Tom laid the other paper in her lap and went off to the window as if to leave her free to enjoy it unseen. But he could not help a glance now and then, and as Polly's face brightened, his own fell. Oh, Tom, that's a birthday present worth having, for it's beautifully given. I don't see how you can refuse it. Arthur Sidney is a real nobleman, cried Polly, looking up at last with her, with her fact glowing maybe her face, and her eyes full of delight. So he is. I don't know another man living except father who would have done such a thing or who I could bring myself to take it from. Do you see? He's not only paid the confounded debts, but has done it in my name to spare me all I could. I see. It's like him, and I think he must be very happy to be able to do such a thing. It's an immense weight off my shoulders, for some of those men couldn't afford to wait till I begged, borrowed, or earned the money. Sidney can wait, but he won't long if I know myself. You won't take it as a gift, then? Would you? No. Then don't think I will. I'm a pretty poor affair, Polly, but I'm not mean enough to do that. Well, I've got a conscience and pair of hands. A rough speech, but it pleased Polly better than the smoothest Tom had ever made in her hearing, for something in his face and voice told her that the friendly act had roused a nobler sentiment than gratitude, making the canceled obligations of the boy debts of honor to the man. Oh, no, it stopped. I'm frozen. Hate when it gets glitchy. Ugh, probably better stop. But I'm probably right at the end. I don't know. I'll stop there. I hope it hadn't been glitchy all this time. We're well, gone. All right. Yeah, I'll stop right there. Okie dokie. Hope to see you live at five. Be sweet. Don't be ugly. Bye-bye.